it as they say. Murray Sabre, and welcome to the conversation today. Great to be with you, John. It is a pleasure to be with you. You're joining us from Naples. I'm south of Salt Lake City in Utah. And today we're going to be talking about the finance of healthcare and wellness and uh, sorry, I'm going to say that again. Today we're going to be talking about the finance of healthcare, wellness and innovative approaches to employee medical insurance. Uh, now, employee health, employee wellness uh, and the costs associated with those offerings uh, within businesses is a really big concern for a lot of executives, for a lot of HR people too. And this is a really important topic to explore, like how with increasingly, you know, year after year, double digit increases in healthcare costs and expenses, it's getting harder and harder to, to provide decent coverage for employees for basic health uh, insurance. And it's getting more and more expensive all the time. So, uh, you know, maybe taking a step back and rethinking how we do this uh, could be worthwhile, uh, saving companies money, but also helping employees get more, you know, bigger bang for their buck and get, get better coverage. Sure. As we get started, I wanted to share Sabrin's bio with everybody. Seasoned author and finance expert Murray Sabrin is Emeritus Professor of Finance at uh, Ramapo. Is that how you say that? That's perfect. He is the Emeritus. Uh, excuse me, seasoned author and finance expert Murray Sabrin is Emeritus Professor of Finance at Ramapo College of New Jersey. He His new book provides business decision makers with the information they need to match the optimal healthcare plan with the culture of their workforce. I love that. And I'm excited to have this conversation. Anything else you would like to highlight by way of your background or personal context before we dive on in? Well, I, I've been writing on on Substack now for a couple of years at murraysabrin.substack.com. And my memoir came out um, exactly a year ago um, in November of 2022, which describes um, my journey coming to America as a, as a toddler in 1949 up until my first political campaign as the Libertarian Party candidate for governor in New Jersey in 1997. And I go through my journey from uh, basically uh, a, a youngster in the New York, in New York City um, in, uh, learning the culture of, um, of uh, liberalism and uh, then realizing that uh, that was not going to solve America's issues. And so uh, the journey... Uh, ended me up uh, 50 years ago as being a libertarian, small L, and then um, I was recruited to run for governor in 97 and became the first third party candidate in Jersey history to uh, raise enough funds to uh, get matching from the state, which required me to be in three debates with the uh, two major party candidates. Yeah, interesting, cool background. All right, well, let's dive on in to this conversation and maybe just uh, set the context uh, for a minute. I already just mentioned how healthcare costs continue to rise um, year over year. Um, how about the the state of just health of the American people and American workers today? Where are we at today, you know, say compared to 10 years ago and even 30, 50 years ago? Well, uh, one thing that the CDC has, and I have a chart that describes that, and it's pretty, pretty uh, uh, interesting, to say the least. Uh, chronic diseases in America. Uh, six in 10 American adults have one chronic disease and four in 10 have two chronic diseases, which means that uh, they're probably getting medicated, and I would consider over-medicated for the conditions that they have. And uh, what are these diseases? It's uh, heart disease, cancer, chronic lung disease, stroke, Alzheimer's, diabetes, and uh, uh, chronic kidney disease. And what are the causes? Well, you know that uh, lifestyle is very important. It's tobacco mm -hmm. use, poor nutrition, physical activity, excessive alcohol use. And I would add another thing, uh, dehydration. It seems that's a big problem, mm -hmm. especially nursing homes. As we saw during COVID, uh, people in nursing homes were not getting proper, uh, not only ventilation, uh, they weren't going outside to get fresh air, which we know is a very important component of good health, and sleep. Uh, there's more and more evidence coming out that sleep is critical to good health, both physical and mental, because it gives the body uh, a chance to rejuvenate during the night, especially your brain and get rid of all the toxins that we're exposed to, and not all of them, but a good portion of them while we sleep. And so uh, when I read this material about wellness and I say, why are we here today when supposedly the American people should know what good health is all about? 
and uh, what wellness is all about. And again, to give you some historical perspective on this, when I was an undergraduate student in the 1960s, there were very few students that were overweight. And now 40% of American adults are overweight, and that number is going to 50% by 2030. And we know that uh, excess weight leads to all sorts of problems, diabetes, stroke, heart disease, cancer, uh, knee, knee ailments, uh, ankle ailments, hip ailments. And so uh, th one of the points that I want to make to your audience is the American medical establishment has really failed the American people because what, what one doctor described who has a direct primary care uh, operation called Forward, and it's, it's a wonderful website, goforward.com. And he points out what we have in America is sick care. We don't have health care, which I like to call yeah. medical, which is really medical care. And the way he described it is we just see the doctor when we're ill to try to get medication to deal with the symptoms. And the point that he makes is that doctors should be helping people stay healthy so they don't have to see a doctor, which, of course, puts a crimp in their income. But the point is... The goal of medicine should be to put people into optimal health. And how do you do that? And um, I started learning about this uh, right out yeah. of college. because We had a cousin who uh, moved from uh, New York City to uh, Colorado because she had bad asthma. And she was a big uh, uh, advocate of, uh, of vitamins. And I started learning from her about what vitamins to take. And this is over 50 years ago. And uh, with other people's advice and help, a, a longtime naturopath friend, um, we've been taking supplements in order to boost our immune system, keep our respiratory tract in shape. And these are things that are out there that the American people are apparently not getting from their physicians, certainly because uh, the first thing a physician will do is write a prescription if someone comes in with an ailment or the, or the and we're bombarded now with what? Medication on TV. I mean, when you watch a TV show at night, I would say nearly half of the, of the uh, ads are for prescription drugs, which we never saw 10, 20, 30 years ago. And so people think that this is the magic bullet instead of looking at all the variables, lifestyle things that could make them well, and keep them uh, well. And companies are trying to do this with wellness programs. And it's a very tricky thing because... Uh, there are people that are literally 50, 100 pounds or more overweight. And in the workplace, uh, that could cause uh, loss of productivity, uh, absenteeism, and a whole host of other problems. So companies have to be yeah. cognizant of how the health of their uh, workforce affects their bottom line. Yeah, uh, so much there to unpack. And I like, you know... I, this isn't my area of expertise, so perhaps this term is antiquated. Um, but as you were describing the current situation and, and how things have evolved over time, I just, in my mind, it, it, it calls back to, are we are we being proactive or are we being reactive? Is it preventative mm -hmm. care or are we only prescribing medications to uh, to respond to the symptoms of of ailments that people might have? And And I don't know if preventative care is still the term. Um, that it's proper to use, but it, it seems at least to get at what you're talking about, this idea that, you know, we should be more holistically looking at yep. the various factors that go into the the overall health of an individual and not waiting until someone has all these chronic issues to be to start trying to address them, because by then it's it's largely too late and you're just prescribing medications. Now, I, you know, I'm all for appropriate medications when they're needed, but yep. to the extent that we can uh, you know, have a healthier lifestyle to the extent that we can be better educated on what we eat, how we sleep, how we exercise and how we engage with other people, whether it's at home or in the workplace. I think that is just better for everybody. And, you know, it, it seems to me also, again, I'm not an expert um, in, in the area of, of healthcare finance, but it seems like if we were to do more preventative care, it might cost us a little bit more up front because we haven't been used to doing that and kind of shift the burden of expense. But over time, it seems like it'd be way less expensive, um, you know, for our healthcare system to be able to, to focus on preventative care and then deal with other chronic types of issues or other diseases and health issues as they emerge, be just because there would be way less of it. Well, there's no question about it. Uh, the, 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 Bottom line that I see in all the research that I've done and speaking to physicians and, and, uh, and naturopaths and other um, 
people in the medical field is that lifestyle is critical and the food we eat is extremely critical. We know mm -hmm. that certain foods cause all sorts of uh, problems in the digestive tract. And there's a whole school of thought that says what we eat affects the digestive tract, which then affects the body's um, ability to ward off disease. And one of the things that we, we now know is that inflammation in our body is the precursor to a lot of ailments. And mm -hmm. that starts from a uh, healthy uh, gut, if you will. And um, so we, we try to be as careful as possible in what we eat. And that information should be uh, transmitted to patients. But doctors, from what I've discovered, know very little about nutrition. In fact, my longtime uh, naturopath friend in northern New Jersey, where we live for many uh, years, he lectures at medical schools and he asks students how much nutrition uh, education do they get. And they said very very little. They don't even have a course in it. It may be part of some course, but uh, they get maybe a week or two of uh, nutrition when there's a whole body of literature. And there, and here's what we call, here's what we talk about incentives. And what my uh, friend told me is that uh, around 40% of medical school costs are provided by the pharmaceutical companies. So what do students learn? That if someone comes into your office with an ailment uh, and you diagnose it as that problem X, there's a prescription for that. And God knows how many prescriptions are out there that address various issues. And, and so many, uh, and we know that the pharmaceutical companies are very competitive in dealing with uh, an issue, and there's uh, a, an array of drugs that can deal with it. So, who, uh, how does the doctor determine which drug to, uh, to prescribe? And the question is do we need drugs to deal with some of these issues? And uh, now we have um, a big fanfare with obesity drugs and how that, this is supposed to solve the obesity problem. And um, I, I look around and, uh, John, it's amazing how many young people are 50 to 100 pounds overweight. And these are people in their 20s and 30s. And uh, that means that down the road, uh, if not sooner, they can have a ma major illnesses to contend with. And this is where I think the doctors have to intervene and educate their, uh, their uh, patients about wellness and what they should be putting into their body uh, what type of physical activity they should have, the importance of hydration and sleep that I mentioned earlier. And so it's a whole package that we have to deal with. And companies are trying to implement this with wellness programs. And it becomes very tricky because people sometimes feel stigmatized because they're yeah. overweight, uh, they don't have good mobility. And so it becomes a very sensitive issue for HR departments and companies. And some companies are doing it quite well by uh, introducing incentives for people who do want to lose weight, who want to stop smoking, who may have a, a, a drinking problem and other uh, abuse issues that, they, uh, that uh, debilitates them. And so what's happened, unfortunately, is that a lot of burden has been put on employers to deal with something that is an individual issue. What is the optimal health for an individual and their family? And that, I think, is the crux of one of the issues that we're facing, is that um, should wellness be the responsibility of the employer to the extent that uh, companies pay a lot of money for insurance these days. And uh, we know that employees are paying a lot more out of pocket to uh, pay for the premiums. Uh, the average premium today, Jonathan, believe it, John, believe it or not, is $24,000 a year. That's enormous. That's an That's enormous insane. amount of money for an employer <laughs> to pay for a family yes. uh, to de deal with uh, medical insurance. And there are ways to, to uh, reduce that substantially, we, and we could talk about it um, uh, during the conversation. Yeah, thank you. And yeah, I think your point is well taken. It's like this tension between, on the one hand, this is an individual issue, and there's lots of, I mean, there's privacy concerns. There's, yep. there's lots of sensitivities that need to be put in place for someone who has a chronic condition or is overweight or or whatever and we can't force people at work to participate in those wellness programs um so on the one hand it's like a personal issue on the other hand it very clearly impacts employees ability to like show up and be yep. productive and work effectively and so it is in the company's best interest to try to you know have a healthy workforce um but 
they're caught it's kind of this conundrum uh and then you you add in the expense piece and you know 30 plus percent of of most employees total compensation package is towards their healthcare benefits yep. Yep. Uh, which is a huge burden on organizations and so again it's another incentive for them to try to do whatever they can try you know whatever they can think of to try to help their workers be a little bit more healthy so they can get their their costs down um all of that is happening and it, we're, we're in this labor market where the expectation is is decent health care provided sure. by the organization. And so that's the situation they're in, despite the fact that it it would just be better if if we all just took more personal responsibility over our health. Um, but we we see that that's just not happening. Uh, do you see a way past that conundrum or that tension? This, I think, is a cultural issue because um, decades ago, when I was growing up in New York City back in the 1950s and 60s, uh, before Medicare and Medicaid, by the way, um, again, for little that, that, uh, that I kept up with health care issues, it was, your, it was the family responsibility. So when uh, we, any of uh, the boys were sick, my parents would take us to the doctor. They paid their five dollars. There was no copay. There was no insurance to, to claim. And then we got a prescription. If we, if we need an antibiotic, we go to the local pharmacy and pay a few dollars for uh, that. There was no insurance for that either. And when my father needed a major operation in 1961, uh, he went to Lenox Hill Hospital in Manhattan. And he was a blue collar worker, blue cross, blue shield, uh, picked up most of the cost. And the costs were very minor back then compared to what they are today. I remember seeing uh, articles uh, years ago of what it cost to deliver a baby back in the 1940s and 50s, and people paid out of pocket. Now it's thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars uh, that reflect the uh, malpractice insurance and the cost of the hospitalization and what have you. And um, this is really one of the biggest issues I think we're facing domestically. And it's a $4 trillion expense, John. John, it's four trillion dollars a year we're spending on medical care in this country, and it's right, uh, increasing by uh, five to ten percent a year, depending upon which part of the country you're in. So we know this cannot is not sustainable. That's that's the bottom line, especially with Medicare and Medicaid, two government finance programs uh, that uh, are really uh, in trouble financially. And so the question is, how can employers with uh, with input from their employees? And the uh, insurance companies uh, do something that will uh, reduce costs and improve quality. And there are several alternatives that uh, I've, uh, that are out there. Uh, one is the, the health savings account, which is like an IRA for medical care costs. And to me, that's a no-brainer why companies don't establish them more and more because the individual employee puts money in for taxes, so they save on taxes. The money accumulates like a uh, uh, 401k tax-free and then it's withdrawn tax-free. So it's a triple win for the employee, and you can pay for deductibles and co-pays, what have you. And that's another issue that uh, we should talk about is that I make the point that we're overinsured in this country, and that's because of the notion that employers are responsible for the employee's uh, medical care costs when they're not responsible for their automobile insurance costs or their homeowner's insurance or anything like that that's done in the free market. And we have uh, competitive uh, companies uh, vying for customers' um, dollars. So uh, I, I, eventually, I would like to see that happen for the uh, for medical care and people paying more out of pocket and prices, I think, would come down. And there are alternatives for surgery that is very expensive in your local hospital. And I'll give you a quick example of that, that uh, in doing my research is um, I contacted a, a doctor here in Southwest Florida and she had a patient, a, a primary care doctor who had a patient who needed a, a, an operation I, and he was quoted, the lo and he didn't have insurance, he, and he was quoted $20,000 by the local hospital. And she said, well, you've got to contact the surgery center of Oklahoma in Tulsa and see what they would charge you for the same operation, include, uh, plus uh, airfare to Tulsa from Southwest Florida, that, whatever state you need. And he was quoted $5,000 for the same operation with high quality care. So that's a 75% reduction in what the local hospital is going to charge. So the point of this is that if we could replicate the surgery center of Oklahoma throughout the country, that would be very competitive with the hospitals to say the least. And uh, individuals would save money, the corporation, the businesses would save money if they're using something like that. 
and then we could have health savings accounts to pay for other uh, medical expenses. But the point I want to make is that uh, going to a doctor for an earache or a sore throat is not an insurable event. What's insurable are the big things, uh, heart surgery or, uh, or major cancer treatment, things like that. Just as we don't have insurance to get an oil change for our car, we can get insurance for uh, if we have a big bill like transmission or an engine that needs to be repaired, but we don't have insurance for tire, tires or, uh, or uh, windshield wipers or things like that. We expect to pay that out of pocket. So the analogy is that out of pocket to pay for the little stuff, for the really big stuff, we need insurance. Some people don't need insurance. If you're super wealthy, uh, the Warren Buffett's of the world, uh, and the Michael Bloomberg's of the world, people who have really big bucks, they don't need insurance to, to p take care of uh, their health care needs or their medical expenses. So there are ways we can organize this, but we have to have a discussion since government is heavily involved in uh, mandates and regulations in uh, health care, either at the state level or at the federal level. So again, we need a conversation about what's the best way to provide quality health care at lower prices so the American people will benefit because the $4 trillion rising at 7% a year, 5% a year, is clearly unsustainable because um, it'll bankrupt the, the, the country down the road. And uh, we don't know when that breaking point is. But what I try to do in this book is to pro provide information for employers to say, here are alternatives that you may not have thought about so you can work with your employees because that's the culture we have now. People expect medical yeah. insurance through their employer. And I think that is the difficult thing to change. And there are people who don't want insurance because they realize it's very expensive and costly and they'd rather self-insure, which is they can do that on their own. And uh, once we get that ball rolling, I think 10, 20 years down the road, the medical care system will look a lot different than we have today. And one of the problems is, is the supply of doctors is not keeping pace with the demand for medical care. And that's the real problem, because moving from New Jersey to southwest Florida, and you try to get new, new physicians, it takes three, four months to get an appointment. That was unheard of years ago, to wait yeah, so yeah, long yeah. to get an appointment to see a doctor. And that's causing people to go to the emergency room to get medical care because they can't see a doctor who may be able to nip in the bud some chronic illness that may be developing. Yeah. I, I couldn't help but think about a couple personal examples in my family. And these just highlight the need for more transparency and cost and expense. Yep. Um, so back when I was a PhD student, uh, so this is before I, I had an, I wasn't a university professor at this time. I didn't have, you know, now I have excellent university healthcare um, provided by the university. But at the time I, I was a poor PhD student, young, married, having a child and, and we, we just were self-insured, very expensive, to, um, to be self-insured. And, you know, so we went to the host, the local hospital and we asked, you know, what could we, if we're just planning on this to, to pay out of pocket, um, for, for this delivery, what's it going to cost us? And we were looking at possible supplemental insurance, like Aflac or th those types of things, sure. right. As options. And it, it took me like, five meetings to try to nail anyone down on what it would actually cost for just a regular delivery at the hospital. Um, and they wouldn't put it in writing. I had to like ha have multiple meetings. Finally, they gave me something in writing and said, this is just an estimate, but this is what it'll probably cost. Right. So that, that was our plan. We, we planned accordingly. And the time comes that we, we have our delivery. We have a beautiful child. Things go fine. There's no complications, no reason for anything to be more expensive. And when we get the bill, guess what? It was like at least double, you know, what, uh, what they had showed us and what I had documented. Um, and, and so then I had to go back and I had to have additional meetings. I'm like, well, we're not using our insurance for this. We're, we're paying out of pocket. This is what I was told. I understand there could be some variation here, but you know, not double. And that's, that's the reality that we're in. Um, right now, and it makes it yeah. very, very hard to shop around and try to understand and compare costs between places, like in your your surgery example. So the extent we can have more transparency around what things actually cost, yeah. it empowers people to 
to to have more say in in where they get their care and 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 make better decisions for their families. I have some other examples like that, but essentially, you know, that that's the point I want to make. Like it's just really important yeah. that we keep yeah, in mind medical care is the only yeah. sector of the economy. Yeah, medical care is the only sector of the economy where there's there's total lack of transparency. Until you mm-hmm. get the uh, explanation of benefits from your insurance company, you have no idea uh, what what the doctor or the ER is charging or the hospital is charging. And um, this is why, uh, given the internet today, everyone, every doctor, every medical practice, every hospital can post their costs online. And yeah. uh, people can, quote, shop around, just as we shop around for automobiles and clothing and, and electronic equipment. Uh, and this is why there is basically, and I hate to use the word, collusion between the insurers and the uh, medical profession as to keep people in the dark about what's being charged. And um, and employers were, were basically price takers, but I think they're pushing back quite a bit the last few years because uh, premiums have gone up so much that yeah. uh, they want to see more transparency and they're trying to be more creative. And uh, one way of doing that is uh, bringing wellness coach in, wellness coaches to, to the, uh, to the uh, a workplace, uh, getting a nutritionist, uh, providing seminars on, on proper nutrition. Some companies are uh, providing on-site gyms and uh, doctors. Um, another example, I was I attended a meeting of uh, 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 the Free Market Medical Association, and one HR person said um, uh, they brought in uh, they brought in a X-ray machine or an MRI machine uh, to the parking lot. And, and obviously mm-hmm. in, a, in a, some sort of trailer. And the, the cost of the MRI was like $400 as opposed to the hospital, which was like $5,000 or something like that. So when you hear these stories, you say, my God, we're spending so much on medical care and, and diagnostic uh, testing that the costs are so inflated that for most people, they can afford it if they're doing this once every several years, uh, whether it's uh, a colonoscopy, an endoscopy, or any other type of uh, testing uh, procedure. And so uh, we really need insurance for the big stuff, the, the big uh, costs that involve uh, a hospital stay or a major operation. But even those could be uh, reduced given the, the surgery yeah. center of Oklahoma because yeah. they invite doctors from the community uh, who um, post their prices there. And it's a win-win for the patient, for the surgery center, and uh, for wellness, for the for general wellness in, 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 in the community. Yeah. Well, Murray, we've only scratched the surface here. This is a really big topic. There's a whole lot to unpack, uh, but hopefully that was a nice teaser conversation for folks who might be interested in checking out your book and finding out more. Before we wrap things up, if you can just give us, uh, let us know how uh, listeners or viewers can connect with you, where they can find your book, and then give us the final word on the topic for today. Yeah, the book is The Finance of Healthcare. Uh, it's really a guide for entrepreneurs, but it's also good for the private citizen who is self-employed, and that's available on Amazon. And I'm very proud of the book because I really did a lot of research to give good information to uh, the reader as to how companies can reduce their um, uh, medical care costs and insurance costs. Uh, so it's a win-win for everybody. And the best place to reach me is through my Substack column, murraysabrin.substack.com. And I write two, three times a week, depending on the... Uh, topics. It's usually on the economy. Sometimes I'll talk about what's going on politically in the country. And um, uh, it's just a good way of connecting with people. Plus, I just made a major presentation in Fort Myers uh, this past Saturday, November 4th. And um, the the, uh, video is available on the Mises.org website at the uh, videos. And it's it's about the uh, financial situation that we're in, the economic situation that we're in. And, I, and then I go through the data and sort of uh, give my prediction for the next uh, financial crisis that's going to affect the country based upon all the research I've done for the past several decades. Yeah, wonderful. Murray, thank you so much. I encourage the audience to reach out, get connected, find out more about what Murray can do for you, check out the book. And as always, I hope everyone can stay healthy and safe, that you can find meaning and purpose at work each and every day. And I hope you all have a great week.